The following program contains graphic images. Viewer discretion is advised. Each year, the Pell Center at Salve Regina University presents the Pell Center Prize for Storing the Public Square to a storyteller whose work makes a vital contribution to the public dialogue. This year, we honor a documentary filmmaker who reminds us of our shared humanity. She's Daphne Matsuraki, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in historic Newport, Rhode Island. Alongside me is my friend and co-host G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories this matter. And this week we're both telling and celebrating with an accomplished young filmmaker whose short documentary, 4.1 Miles, tells the story of a Greek Coast Guard captain and the desperate plight of refugees making the water transit from Turkey to Greece. Daphne Matsuraki, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, first, congratulations on your, on your many awards, uh, including an, uh, an Oscar nomination, a Peabody Award, uh, and just this month, we're proud to say the Pell Center Prize for Storing the Public Square. So congratulations on all fronts. Um, but let's start with your background. Um, how did you get into filmmaking, and what, what led you to, to produce this story in particular? Um, I always wanted to make documentaries, I think. Um, um, it's a very powerful way of telling stories because of the moving image and the sound and the way uh, a director can make use of, of this. Um, my background um, is in inter international relations and I, I worked as a journalist for a few years uh, back home in, in Greece and in Africa and here in the United States. Um, and then I went back to school at UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism for a second master's degree in documentary filmmaking to make my dream come true. Um, I was in my second year of my master's degree when the refugee crisis was peaking uh, and my home country, Greece, was in the epicenter of it all. So. As you can imagine, um, I was reading tirelessly all the news, um, the front pages, everything was dedicated to the refugee crisis, um, and Greece was in the epicenter of it all. Um, it was interesting uh, when I realized at that point that the more I was reading the news, the more distanced I felt from this reality, uh, which was... Um, a shocking realization to me. Um, I realized that this is what happened as, as something very, very human uh, because we read the news, um, we watch videos, and then we move on with our daily lives uh, here and elsewhere when we're so far away from a conflict, from a, such a tragedy. Um, but because this was taking place in my home, I was expecting to feel a little bit more um, there, um, and I didn't. So. That's what um, drove me to make a film that in a way would bridge this gap between these two worlds, the, these two different realities, the reality of these people um, that were just fleeing war and um, were entering Europe um, through Greece, through the small island of Lesbos, and our reality uh, so far away from, from this tragedy. So you, you hit on really sort of the heart of storytelling, the way Jim and I uh, view it and many other people too, and the, the emotional connection. I mean, I, I think when you read news and you're flipping through and you don't get that emotional connection, it doesn't really always certainly connect to your heart or, or to your soul. Your film, 4.1 Miles, does that so powerfully. For those of us in our audience who may not have seen the film, just briefly describe 
what 4.1 miles is? So 4.1 miles is the distance uh, between the western coast of Turkey and the small Greek island of Lesbos. Um, refugees fleeing war from Syria um, are still being smuggled through Turkey and as they're trying to reach Europe they're smuggled in these inflatable deadly boats to the small island of Lesbos. The film is a day in the life of a Greek Coast Guard captain, Kyriakos Papadopoulos, um, who has found himself suddenly in the middle of the biggest humanitarian crisis since World War II, and he has no other option but to respond. Um, his job um, involved just routine border patrol around the Greek island of Lesbos just to make sure that there, there is no national threat. Um, he was not even trained to do CPR, the boat is very small and suddenly him and his small crew of four have to deal uh, with this uh, emergency of unprecedented scale um, with no infrastructure, not, right, not the necessary instruments uh, and tools uh, that you need in, in such an emergency. Um, he's dealing with it, he's putting his own life um, into danger um, and he's, he's just responding in the most heroic way a person could. So uh, that's really uh, what the film is, the rescues that you see in the film are all from this one day, October 28th, uh, 2015. And it's just a slice uh, of in his life and a slice of reality that I think really demonstrates the scale and gets really into the heart uh, the, um, the, and the heart of the issue and the emotional, um, it touches the, the emotional cords of the issue. So you mentioned the captain who I think sort of leaps from the screen in, 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 in heroic fashion. Um, how did you find him? Well. When I decided that I, I want to, to make this film, I was reading that there were a lot of people that were drowning uh, in, in their effort to cross from Turkey to Greece. Uh, as they're being smuggled, um, they, they have to pay around two, at the time they had to pay around $2,000 per person to get on this boat. Um, a boat that would, was made to feed five to six people um, but as you see in the film, um, these boats are packed with 50, 60, 70 yeah. people. Wow. Uh, the smuggler is not on board and they would just tell the refugees, here is Greece straight, uh, straight ahead, just go. These people had never seen the sea before oftentimes or uh, certainly most of them did not know how to, to drive a boat. Uh, most of them did not know how to swim. Um, so. When I was reading that there were a lot of drownings uh, in this process, um, I found out that the Greek Coast Guard was involved in the rescues. Um, so for me, Kyriakos Papadopoulos and his crew um, were just a, a, a geographical, in a way, a realistic and metaphoric um, point where these two worlds uh, collide. Um, in the middle of the Aegean Sea. And he is the person, um, he's the first person that comes to contact with these people in the middle of the sea. Um, and I found that significant and I, I, I worked very hard to get access on this Coast Guard boat. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a very bureaucratic process, like trying to get access on a, on a police helicopter here yeah. in the US. It took me months uh, to convince them uh, the importance of not just uh, me getting on, a, on the boat once, but being on this boat for three weeks and filming with this man outside his work, but his home and really getting to know him. Um, and they would not give me access for a very long time. Uh, at some point I did convince them that this is the only way to, to to create empathy for a large audience. Um, a different 
a different understanding of this reality uh, than the news creates. Um, so I did get access. Um, I hadn't managed to speak to him uh, until I, I was on, on, on at the airport in San Francisco about to fly to Greece. When I spoke to him on the phone finally, um, and I, because the story was not in the news anymore, I asked him, are there any boats coming still? What is the situation? And I remember uh, the sound um, of his voice. Uh, he said to me, you just ha have to come here and see. I just have no words to explain to you. You just come here and see. So from just the tone in his voice, I just, I knew um, the way he's caring and that he would be an incredible protagonist for the film. And how? Wow, is right. Um, so you didn't have a large crew. It was you and one other person. Do I have that correct? Yes, it was me um, producing, directing, and shooting. Uh, and my esteemed colleague, James Pace Cornsilk, who was doing uh, the sound on the film. And of course, he was with me all the time, and he was my soundboard in this process. Um, in this type of... Um, um, of shoots, you really have to be agile, and you can't um, have a five, six member crew. Um, you have to be uh, small and be able to maneuver yourself, and of course not be um, in the middle of a, if, of a situation, not be a burden. Um, so uh, you, you said that you, you, the, the film itself depicts the events of a single day, but how long were you actually there filming? How, how, how long was the actual shoot? I was filming for three weeks. Uh, I filmed a lot of things. I was almost every day on this boat. I filmed a lot of interviews yeah. uh, with um, the people of the island, various other events, refugees. And then I, I brought all the footage back to California, uh, about to edit it myself. And as I was logging in the footage and I was realizing and I was trying to make sense of it and decide on the structure of the film, what would be the most effective way to tell this story. I knew, um, I knew from the beginning that this one day was the core of, of my story. Uh, every day was pretty much like that, but this was the first day I, I went on the boat. So the, the footage, really reflects my panic, I think. Um, and I think it, it, it's, it, it conveys it uh, to the audience. And then it was an as, uh, even more dramatic day than the rest of the days because at the end of it, there was a, at the end of a series of rescues, dramatic rescues, there was a huge shipwreck where about 200 people were in the water at the end of the night. Um, so that particular day was, to me, especially dramatic. And I knew this from the beginning. And I knew I had this. Um, so when I went back and I was thinking what to do, I tried a few things. And then, you know, I realized sometimes less is more. And just one day conveys uh, even a stronger message of how dramatic and how dangerous and terrible the situation was we're gonna uh we're gonna listen and take a look at at this in just a second but we do need to take a moment for station identification this is story in the public square where storytelling meets public affairs this program can be heard three times every weekend on sirius xm satellite radio's politics of the united states the potus channel 124. We're produced each week by an outstanding crew of professionals at Rhode Island PBS. I'm Jim Lutis. In my day job, I run the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. You can find me on Twitter at JM Lutis. My co-host, author, filmmaker, man of many talents is G. Wayne Miller, who's also an accomplished journalist at the Providence Journal. You can tweet him at G. Wayne Miller. And finally, our guest is an Academy Award nominated filmmaker, Daphne Matsuraki. She tweets at D. Matsiraki, D-M-A-T-Z-I-A-R-A-K-I. And she's also the 2017 Pell Center Prize winner. So we want to take a look at a scene where refugees have just been brought to shore and people are fighting to keep them alive through a lot of chaos. We do want to warn the audience that this scene does contain graphic and disturbing images. Let's take a look. Yeah. 
So you mentioned uh, a moment ago that you were acutely aware of the audio and the sound. And I'm wondering, particularly, I noticed, uh, having watched the film a number of times now, uh, that audio seems like it's very important, um, whether it's the anguished cries of families and children looking for their parents uh, or, or parents looking for their children, uh, or even uh, there's a scene where there's a, it looks like a fisherman mm -hmm. uh, working on the, on, on, the, on the nets, and the audio is striking. And I'm wondering what you were trying to achieve if, as the filmmaker. Was there something about the audio that was particularly important to you? I think um, in a documentary, the sound is even more important than the image. You can have a um, bad image with good sound and still convey the message. But if you have good image with bad sound, it's just unwatchable. Um, I think that you should be able to, to watch a film with your eyes closed. Um, and, 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 and understanding that, and that's one of my principles. So whenever I can, I, 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 I desire to have a dedicated sound uh, person uh, with me. And um, sometimes this is not always possible, but uh, with great advice from sound people, um, there is ways to, to get really good sound, but good sound is really important to me is part of a scene, essential part of the scene. Um, and of course, sound mixing, um, which takes place at the end, at the post-production of a documentary, is essential to bring these uh, sounds up, to clean them, to make sure that they're there. The, the sound recording quality is totally amazing. So your, your sound man did a fabulous job. But the sound mix, as you said, is also spectacular. I mean, it, and I think you're right. You, you really could watch that, listen to that film, not just watch it, just listen to it without seeing the images and certainly get sort of the core message, the emotions and, and that the really reach out to you. So you and your sound person, yourselves, took a bit of a risk doing this. I mean, you go out on this boat, you see the waves. This isn't like going out on some little placid lake where, you know, you're in America or, or Greece inland or whatever. This is a dangerous place. Were you aware of that danger going over there? And, and what do you think in the middle of it? Um, I was aware of it uh, up to the extent that I could be without having been there in real life. So. Um, no, I, uh, what I had seen and what I had read um, was really undermining the reality of the situation. Um, when I went there and saw what actually is going on, I remember looking up in the sky and thinking, where is everyone? Where are the helicopters? Where is the world? What is happening? Um, why is it just um, for small Greek Coast Guard boats and some volunteers here and nobody else. Where is the United States? Where is England? Where is Europe? Where is everyone? Where's the police? So um, it was, it w the scale of it was massive. Um, and when I realized that, um, I, I knew that I had major responsibility to tell this story and in the most realistic um, non sensationalized um, truthful and accurate way I could I, I I felt that was my obligation as a filmmaker um, so I felt that the danger of me being in the boat was very small comparing to what these people were going through. Um, so I just did it despite um, the harshness and the difficulty of it all. And I, I really don't take pride in this because I, 
I think that what these people are actually going through is far more um, dangerous and, and so you, traumatic. But you, you bore witness uh, for the rest of us yeah. uh, in, terms of, in terms of bringing this reality and this, what's happening on these waters to a broader audience. I, I, I know the emotional response that I've had watching the film, uh, and I suspect that other people who watch it will have that same, that same response. What kind of toll did this have on you? I, actually being a witness to it is different than watching it on screen. Um, it was, every day was very hard and every day uh, my colleague and I were begging that there, there would be no other call for rescue. We did not want to be on that boat. Uh, we did not want to see what we were seeing, even though it was very, um, we wanted to make the film, but we actually wish we didn't have to. Um, so, and, and on top of that, I, I had to edit this <laughs> myself. So I re I've revisit revisited these images over and over and over again. Even though it was the hardest, uh, one of the hardest experiences I've ever had personally because I have never seen a uh, tragedy in that scale um, and I, I, I'm not a war correspondent. Um, I haven't seen death in this scale either or fear in this scale uh, before. Um, I really thought that there wasn't another film that I should be making in a different place that I should be. I felt that I should be there and I should make this film. And this really was a drive for me and gave me a lot of strength. And the strength of these people and of the captain gave me a lot of strength to, to make it. Did, did it change you? It really did, yes. Because um, you realize that the 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 fine line between life and death is 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 so close to you and it's so it's it's the same for everyone it's the same for every um mother and for every child no, regard re, regardless any religion or political belief or ideology it's the same the fear is the same um happiness is the same and relief is the same so these people were just trying to to breathe and the captain was they were not asking for anything else and the captain was just trying to help them do that and to see a man um, when the rest of the world in a way was turning its back to the problem when the problem was everywhere in the news, but still there was not actual any help there. And he was bearing the cost of this humanitarian crisis on his own, pretty much, with his colleagues. That gave me enormous um, hope in humanity. Wow, powerfully put. Do, do you have any sense that this film, which I'm assuming has been seen by countless people on the New York Times site, I can't imagine it wouldn't be in the hundreds of thousands or millions of, of views. I don't have the numbers. Do you have any sense that this has had any impact on the policymakers and the politicians of the world, and specifically involved in that region, any effect on them in terms of changing their thinking or possibly connecting to them on an emotional level where they might sort of step back from the geopolitics and their own, you know, their own particular self-interest and go, wait a second, this is unacceptable. Do you have any sense of that? Or, or? Well, um, f first of all, I've had countless messages and uh, from, from just common people or organizations or political organizations contacting me and asking me how can they help countless thousands of messages of people that um, told me that after watching the film they went to the island and volunteered themselves. Oh, wow. I remember a 60 um, year old woman who, who told me that she just, from the United States, uh, she told me that she had spinal cord surgery, then she watched the film and then she went to the island and helped. So. Uh, for me, that's the most important thing. Um, the film has screened um, 
all over the world and uh, I do know and I've received messages from the Greek government um, that and from the, 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 the Minister for Immigration of Greece um, that has really asked me and I have put, put, put them in contact with the right people and they have really acknowledged a different side of the um, problem and I think that Greece despite the um, I'm not taking uh, any you know credit for that by no means but um, uh, Greece uh, amid, amid the the biggest uh, financial crisis uh, in recent years that has been going through for the past seven years I think um, has offered um, countless support to uh, these people with very limited infrastructure where when other countries have been closing their borders um, Greece is still welcoming these people so uh, this, the film also screened in Amsterdam and I know that in the theater there were a lot of uh, politicians and representatives uh, of political parties so I really want to hope that um, this has made a change. Like you mentioned, the film um, is available on the New York Times uh, webpage for free um, the, uh, in their Opdocs section. Um, and I know that hundreds of thousands of people have watched the film. I, I will, I'm hoping that among them there are some decision makers. And you've got uh, this coming week on June 26th, Monday, uh, another broadcast, the broadcast premiere of the film? It's a national broadcast uh, premiere of the film at PBS uh, th POV 30th series. Well, um, it is a, a profoundly moving film and a tremendous piece of work. We were thrilled to honor you at the Pell Center with the Pell Center Prize, uh, and uh, people should watch this film. So, Thank you so much. Daphne Matsiraki. The film is 4.1 miles. If you want to connect with us online, please find us on Facebook or Twitter, or you can visit PellCenter.org, where you can also catch up on previous episodes. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.